is taking a big chunk out of my life where I've just not been able to do anything. Not knowing what's going on, it just sucks, man. You know your body is falling apart and this thing could fix it, but you can't have it. It was the worst time in my life because I knew what would happen if I didn't get timely treatment. Waiting. That's what almost 6.3 million people across England are doing. You feel like you've completely fallen through the cracks. It's a really scary place to be at. Stuck in a queue for the National Health Service that many say is taking too long. When Ian went in for a routine scan in 2021, he didn't think he had anything to worry about. He was a fit and healthy engineer. I used to love independent travel. That's me in the front of the White House. That's me in Egypt diving with some friends in the Red Sea. But after waiting a month, a test delivered the news no one wants to hear. They had found a tumour there in my, um, in my bowel. I was set down by a nurse who um, quickly gave me a pitch about, uh, we found you early, things will be fine, we'll get rapid treatment, blah, blah. And did you get that rapid treatment? No. It was the worst time in my life between getting that letter of urgent referral for suspected cancer and actually starting treatment. I knew what would happen if I didn't get timely treatment. I've enough experience of cancer to know that it loves time and it will advance. And I tried reaching out to so many people to get help, to get treatment quickly, and there was absolutely nothing at that stage. No one really wanted to know me. When cancer is suspected, patients in England are supposed to start treatment less than 62 days later. Ian says it took him far longer to start chemotherapy, around three months, going between different doctors. And while he was waiting, a scan showed things had progressed from his initial stage one diagnosis. It revealed it was well established by then in my abdomen. So at that stage, I was stage four. What was it like to hear those words? You know, it hit me like a bombshell to know it, but it took away the uncertainty and strangely enough, I found a sense of peace really uh, that I didn't when I was in this sort of no man's land waiting for an outcome. Ian went ahead with treatment doing what he could to prolong his life. But even after chemo and surgery, the cancer had spread to his liver. Crucially, it was still operable, but he told us it took another two months to get approval for the surgery. While all these tests were going on, uh, the liver um, tumours had grown by default and I was again ineligible for surgery. So at this point, they tried shrinking it with chemotherapy, uh, which didn't work. I was pretty much told, uh, there's nothing we can do for you on chemotherapy. You know, get ready for, uh, you know, the inevitable. Ian says he was eventually offered more chemotherapy, but his prognosis still isn't good. The writing's on the wall now. It's in my liver. Perhaps the best I can hope for is just get another summer. After years of COVID backlog and staff striking over pay conditions, the waiting list in England is beginning to fall. And with cancer, 91% of patients start treatment within the target time of 31 days from diagnosis. In A&E, the chances of waiting more than four hours have been falling for months. Improvements the service attributes to hardworking staff. But it also says pressure on the NHS isn't going anywhere. And for many, neither is their illness. It's almost like being tortured because people have essentially said, it doesn't matter to us to fix the fact that you're in pain. For most of her life, University lecturer Flora has been living with a condition she didn't even know existed. I don't know if you know those wooden toys where you press the bottom and they sort of collapse in on themselves because they're held together by elastic. And basically that is how my whole body works. Symptoms started when she was a child, but it wasn't until her 30s that the pain became persistent. I went to see my GP about this and I kind of imagined they would tell me, you know, you're working too much at your desk, you're an academic, you're not very sporty, you should maybe do more exercise. And to be told, oh, you have this lifelong condition that if you do a quick Google search, you immediately find out is quite degenerative and has a really serious impact on people was kind of shocking. Like, I think I walked home in this sort of slight daze of like, I don't really know what's happening around me right now. Flora was told she likely had Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or EDS, a rare condition that affects a body's connective tissue. But more tests were needed. First, she was sent to a physiotherapist at the local hospital and then put on a waiting list for a specialist clinic in London. 
She says six months later, she still hadn't heard back. I just left voicemail after voicemail and eventually got hold of someone and she said, um, we're really backlogged. It's going to be at least a year before we see you. And eventually during COVID, I got a letter from them to say, oh, we'd like to offer you an appointment now. And then a month later, I got a letter saying, we've cancelled your appointment because we don't have capacity because of COVID. Um, and they just sent me a printout of the PowerPoint slides they would show you. And that was the last I've ever heard from them. So what sort of treatment were you offered at that point? Uh, nothing. My GP said, I feel uncomfortable prescribing anything until you've seen a specialist. So I was sort of in this catch 22, like if we can't prescribe you anything, you should see a specialist and the specialist say, we can't see you. So I really felt at that point, I had no choice but to go private. Flora told us a couple of private appointments and some tests set her back several thousand pounds. But after tearing the cartilage in her hips, she still needs surgery, which she can't afford to pay for privately. She's now been on the wait list for 18 months, during which she says her condition has worsened. If I had surgery a year ago, I probably wouldn't be using a wheelchair. I wouldn't be using crutches. My surgeon has said to me there's a 70 to 80% chance that if I have surgery, I would be entirely pain-free from my hips. And how are you feeling about your future? It feels like my life is kind of on hold while I'm waiting, you know, to get to the top of the waiting list again. It's sort of devastating. It makes you just feel like the healthcare system is collapsing. Public satisfaction with the health service is at an all-time low. And the main reason is long waits for hospital and GP appointments. Sometimes not knowing is the hardest part of all. I've always been active. Like I've skateboarded since I was like 14. Um, so I've always been quite fit and healthy. But one morning in 2021, that all changed for pub manager Adam when he had a skateboarding accident. It just bent the bad way, <laughs> the way it's not meant to go. Uh, what, uh, can I take a content number for you, please? It hurt, it felt like it was really loose and jiggly. So went to hospital, we were told that the wait would be about 20 hours to get seen to by anyone that could do an X-ray or anything like that. Um, eventually get seen by, I think it was a triage nurse. And I hobbled in and they were like, no, you're fine, off you go. He stopped skating and implemented his own physio routine, but was still in pain. Nine months later, he was back at the hospital. The x-ray was pretty instant and they were like, eh, it's puffy, we can't see. So I had to wait three months for an MRI and then eventually got that. Had to wait another month after that to be seen by a doctor that can actually analyse the MRI and tell me what's wrong with my knee. And they're like, yep, so you've clearly got a very broken ACL. It's obliterated. Adam says he opted to have surgery and was told it would be a six to nine month wait. We were planning to get married. That didn't happen because that's kind of in the peak of when the surgery was meant to be. It really impacted like my work. I couldn't take deliveries or do any of the heavy lifting. I'm a musician, so I had to cancel gigs. I couldn't go to festivals. I couldn't go skateboarding anymore, which really impacted my social life. Not knowing what's going on, it just sucks, man. It was, yeah, it was a real hard time. Definitely played on my mental health for quite a while. In the end, Adam waited 13 months for surgery, 25 months from his initial injury. What was it like the first time you went skateboarding again? Were you nervous? So I, did, so I normally start at the hill, the top of the hill, and I got on about three quarters of the way down. <laughs> it was like, I'm not going to go all the way. <laughs> Despite general dissatisfaction with the NHS, most people still believe in the principle. Both major political parties say fixing the health service is a priority, and almost half the population want more to be spent on public health. They're doing the best they can with what they've got, and they deserve a lot more. Life's not quite back to normal yet, but Adam is on the road to recovery. But for many people like Flora and Ian, the rest of their lives could be spent fighting for help through the NHS. I need this to work because there isn't an alternative. I have no control over what's wrong with my body, but we could fix the NHS and we could fix how people access healthcare. Hoping for surgery, support, and life itself, no matter how long is left. Too often we're just sort of details and statistics, but if it can be just realised that what they're really doing by this is handing out post-dated death certificates to these people, and there's a human story behind all of it, of this waiting and what it does to you.